I know I'm a couple minutes late here. Sorry about that. Anyway, what I have here is a certificate. A fancy, spared no expense for this certificate here. This is to certify that, then we filled in the name, has faithfully attended, check one, every, almost all, most, a few, at least one, Haru Raha Lodge Monday Night Magic Class, The Book of Lies. I swear to God I did. Signed by Lon and Constance. And that was back in May of 2017. We did a series on the Book of Lies. Uh, this, <laughs> this book, I'm sure there's a paperback out now. I got this in 1974. Thinking that I was uh, getting a Crowley book that perhaps I could I could understand with my 1974 uh, brain uh, and uh, I was kind of uh, puzzled when I opened it up and, and read it the first time but in any, anyway it was the first little thing that uh, uh, or one of the first things that I read that had been edited uh, and introduced by uh, uh, Israel Regardi, anyway. At least uh, Regardi had uh, had a hand in its uh, its publication by Weiser. It was originally published in uh, 1913. Now I'm not going to read the whole book of lies. Sorry, I, I'm not going to do that. But when I was uh, rolled out of bed this morning and and I was grumbling that I didn't know what I was going to do, uh, uh, do today for today's talk. Constance just said, Layla. And referring to Layla Waddell. And uh, I said, oh, no, that, that, that'll take a lot of preparation and everything. Oh, oh gee, no, well, let me do something easy. But then on my walk to go get coffee this morning when I went to Temple, it dawned on me. The Book of Lies. Okay. And so I'm going to share this with you. And it may take a couple days because, well, first of all, l let me read to you what uh, Crowley had to say about the Book of Lies and then perhaps uh, we'll better understand why Layla is so important. Uh, this is from Crowley's Confessions. Nonetheless, I could point to some solid achievement on a large scale, although it is composed of more or less disconnected elements. I refer to the Book of Lies. In this, there are 93 chapters. We count as a chapter the two pages filled respectively with a note of interrogation and a mark of exclamation. Or, uh, yeah, a mark of exclamation. So the hunchback, a question mark, and a soldier, exclamation mark. Well, I'll show you actually, it's no big thing. There's the first two chapters right there. Soldier and the Hunchback. Or the Hunchback and the Soldier in that order. Okay. That wasn't a digression. That was, I needed to do that. Other chapters contain sometimes a single word, more frequently from a half dozen to 20 phrases, occasionally anything up to a dozen to 20 paragraphs. The subject of each chapter is determined more or less uh, definitively by Kabbalistic import of its number. Thus, chapter 25 gives a revised ritual of the pentagram. 
72 is a rondelle of, uh, with the refrain Shemhem Faresh, the divine name of 72 letters. Chapter 77 is Layla, whose name adds up to that number. And, and 80, the number of pays, referred to Mars, uh, uh, a, pen, a panegyric upon war. Sometimes the text is serious and straightforward. Sometimes it's uh, obscure oracles demand deep knowledge of the Kabbalah for interpretations. That lost young lawn, I tell you. Others contain obscure allusions, play upon words, secrets expressed in cryptogram, double or triple meaning, which must be combined in order excuse me, I want it, to appreciate the full flavor. Others, again, are subtly ironical or cynical. At first sight, the book is a jumble of nonsense intended to insult the reader. It requires infinite study, sympathy, intuition, and initiation. Given these, I do not hesitate to claim that in none other of my writings have I given so profound and comprehensive an exposition of my philosophy on every plane. Okay, and he goes on, talks about his association with Freemasonry. And uh, then finally he says this. Shortly after the production, the publication, the OHO, the outer head of the OTO, came to me. At that time, I did not realize there was anything in the OTO beyond a convenient compendium of the more important truths of Freemasonry. He said that since I was acquainted with the supreme secret of the order, I must be allowed the ninth degree and obligated in regard to it. I protested I knew no such secret. He said, but you've printed it here in the plainest language. I said that I could not have done so because I did not know it. He went to the bookshelves, taking out a copy of the Book of Lies. He pointed to a passage in the despised chapter. Okay, that was early on, he said. He, he wrote a chapter and didn't like it and then threw it away and then put it back in and then threw it away and put it back in and then put it back in to show spite to his readers. It was a despised chapter. It instantly flashed upon me the entire symbolism, not only of Freemasonry, but of many other traditions blazed upon my spiritual vision. From that moment, the OTO assumed its proper importance in my mind. I understand that I held in my hands the key to the future progress of humanity. The commentary, which is, see, the Book of Lies is just this part, but the commentary is on the opposite page, and that commentary was written later. The commentary was written in 1921. And the student will find it very helpful for the light it throws upon many passages. So the commentary is written about nine or ten years, or eight or nine years later. Okay. Ah, uh, thank you, darling. Constance brought our own our own coffee table picture of Leila Waddell. There she is. Her picture has graced our home for many, 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 many years. Okay, I'm skipping a, oh. In order to try to wrap my pedestrian meat brain around the Book of Lies, I organized the chapters like that. Okay. There's the chapters that feature the word capital I, capital T, 
and the chapters that highlight the word that and their thirded my organization there, you'll see the chapters that refer to the Layla. And then paired to Rabo and V, 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 things like that. Okay. That way, instead of trying uh, continually, repeatedly read the book from cover to cover kind of thing, I read the chapters that referred to each other. And all of those refer to Layla. And that's how I'm going to share this with you in the next day or so. So, number one is page 20 or chapter 28. The Pole Star. I'm going to read the commentary first because this will set the stage. This now introduces the principal character of this book, Layla, who is the ultimate feminine symbol to be interpreted on all planes. He made her a god. The object, the Bhakti Yogi divinity in his life, and he worshipped her as such. Layla, who is the ultimate feminine symbol to be interpreted on all planes. But in this chapter, little hint is given of anything beyond physical love. It is called Pole Star because Layla is the one object of devotion to which the author ever turns. Note the introduction of the name of the beloved in, uh, uh, in line 15. Okay. Here it is, chapter 28, the Pole Star. Love is all virtue, since the pleasure of love is but love, and the pain of love is but love. Love taketh no heed of that which is not and of that which is. Absence exalteth love, and presence exalteth love. Love moveth ever from height to height of ecstasy, and faileth never. The wings of love droop not with time, nor slacken for life or for death. Love destroyeth self uniting self with that which is not self, so that love breedeth all and none in one. Is it not so? No? Then thou art not lost in love. <clears throat> Speak not of love. Love always yieldeth. Love always hardeneth. L A Y L A H. Maybe I write it, but to write her name. Okay, I think we get the idea that Crowley is. Gaga in love with Layla, so much so that he projected godhood. He worshipped the absolute in the form, in the person of Layla. The next Layla chapter is the very next one, chapter 29. 
the Southern Cross. Now, I mistakenly told Constance this morning that Layla was uh, uh, a New Zealander, and I think actually she came originally from New Zealand, but uh, she's Australian, or at least Crowley refers to her as an Australian. So I have to apologize to Constance for telling her that it was... Oh, because my calendar says it's Australia Day. Okay, it's Australia Day. So I think it's today anyway. Happy, happy, happy. Chapter 29. It says it continues, chapter 28. And I'll read it again, the commentary first. Note that the word Layla is Arabic for night. The author begins to identify the beloved with N-O-X previously spoken of uh, in uh, uh, says C chapter 1 and hang on I, I don't want to constantly do this because this goes back and forth chapter 1 is called the Sabbath of the goat oh I mean, the letter O, explanation point. But it's O and an explanation point. It's a round thing and a pointy thing together. Now, the Greeks ecstatically yelled, Yo, yo, yo! Do I, do I have to draw you a picture? Okay. Oh, the heart of N-O-X, because the O's in the middle, We've got an X on that, okay? The Knight of Pan, Pan, duality, energy, death. Death, begetting the supporters of O. To beget is to die, to die is to beget. Cast the seed into the field of night. Life and death are two names of a. Kill thyself. Neither of these alone is enough. Well, that's enough Zen-like inscrutability to keep you busy for a while. But that's where they first, he first introduced this NOX principle. So note that Layla is the Arabic uh, for night. The author begins to identify the beloved with NOX previously spoken of. The chapter is called the Southern Cross because on the physical plane, Layla is an Australian. Here it is. The Southern Cross. Love, I love you. Night, night cover us. Thou art night. O oh, my love, and there are no stars but thine eyes. Dark night, sweet night, so warm and yet so fresh, so scented, yet so holy. Cover me, cover me. Let me be no more. Let me be thine. Let me be thou. Let me be neither, thou nor I. Let there be love in night and night in love. N-O-X, the night of Pan and Layla, the night before his threshold. Okay, that's the second Layla. The next one is 49. Now, 49 is the square of 7, by the way. And 7 is the star of Babylon.
49, Varatha blossoms. Now, there's a long, 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 long commentary on this one. Okay. 49 is the square of 7. 7 is the passive and feminine number. The chapter should be read in connection with chapter 31 for it now appears. The word it, remember in my uh, organization, I organized all of the, the ones that mentioned it, but I'm not going to open up that can of worms at the moment. The chapter heading, the Waratha, is a voluptuous scarlet flower common in Australia. And this connects the chapter with chapter 28 and 29, the ones that we just read. But this is only an allusion, for the subject of the chapter is Our Lady Babylon, who is conceived as the feminine counterpart of it. IT. This does not agree very well with the common or orthodox theogony of chapter 11, but is to be explained by the uh, dithyrambic nature of the chapter. In paragraph 3, it says, no man, okay, we'll see that in a second, it says, no man is, of course, Nemo, the master of the temple. Libra 4.18 will explain most of the allusions in this chapter. Okay, it'll be noticed uh, that this seal, I'm skipping ahead, uh, except for the absence of the border, is the official seal of the AA. And it's a compare chapter 3. It is also said to be the seal upon the tombs of them she hath slain, that is, the masters of the temple. It connects with the number 49, see Libra 418, and, and the 22nd Aether, as well as the usual authorities. Okay, here's the chapter, 49. Waratha blossoms. Seven are the veils of the dancing girls in the harem of it. Seven are the names and seven are the lamps beside her bed. Seven eunuchs guard her with drawn swords. No man, Nemo, no man may come nigh unto her. In her wine cup are seven streams of blood of the seven spirits of God. Seven are the heads of the beast, wherein she rideth. The head of the angel, the head of a saint, the head of a poet, the head of an adulterous woman, the head of a man of valor, the head of a satyr, and the head of a lion serpent. And those of you familiar with the Thoth Tarot will find all of those heads on the lion in the lust card, the old strength card. Seven letters hath her holiest name, and it is Babylon. This is the seal upon the ring that is on the forefinger of it. And it is the seal upon the tombs of them whom she hath slain. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding, and remember when you capitalize understanding in Crowley material, he's referring to the title of Bina, where Babylon lives, okay? Above the abyss, number three on the tree of life. Here is wisdom, and wisdom is number two on the tree of life. Chokmah. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of Our Lady, for it is the number of a woman, and her number is an hundred and fifty-six. That is that Layla chapter.
And I know we're, it's going to take us a while to get through all of this, so I'm going to turn to the next one. And we'll probably pick it up tomorrow. Fifty-five. Now, why is this a Layla one? Excuse me for a second. Oh, yes, of course. Drooping sunflower. So 55 refers to Malkuth on the Tree of Life, or the Bride. It should be uh, read in connection with chapter 28, 29, and 49, which we've already done. <laughs> What's that, darling? Um, I'll tell you later. <laughs> oh boy, maybe I'm in trouble. The Drooping Sunflower. The one thought vanished. All my mind was torn to rags. Nay, nay, my head was mashed into wood pulp, and thereon the daily newspaper was printed. Thus I wrote, since my one love was torn from me. I cannot work, I cannot think. I seek distraction here, I seek distraction there, but this is all my truth that I, that I, who love, have lost, and how, and how may I regain? I must have money to get to America. O oh, mage, sage, gauge thy wage, or in the page of thine age is written rage. <laughs> oh, my darling. We should have not have spent 90 pounds in that three weeks in Paris. Slash the brakes on thine arm with a pole axe. <laughs> okay, there's a there's a, an exercise in, in meditation and concentration that, that uh, you're sworn not to do something, and if you do it, like you swear not to say a certain word or think a certain thought, and when you do it, you cut your you cut your arm with a with a knife or a razor, uh, and and so it sets up this uh, this uh, uh, thing in your mind that you don't want to do it because it's kind of a freaky traumatic thing. So he slashed the brakes on thine arm with a pole axe. <laughs> so anyway, I guess Layla went to America and he uh, uh, wants to chase after her. So that's that. What time do we have here? Oh, it's time for it's time for us to stop here. So, yes, dear, did you have something to to add with today's? Well, in case anyone thought that this was all too weird and creepy, uh, and was just Crowley's original thought if you read any Christian mystic or or uh, Rumi or God any other religion the devotional part of it they're all the same thing you see Jesus in the eyes of your beloved and in your enemies and everyone else just look Mother Teresa even if you want to go there. I mean everybody so everybody has the same thought he just explains it a little bit a different point of view and maybe in a slight evolution of that idea yeah. but it's exactly it's exactly the, the same, same thing. yeah so and uh, by golly she was pretty damn inspiring anyway there and she didn't even know I'm alive <laughs> okay <laughs> and you don't even know she's dead and I don't even I'm not Okay, thank you, dear, for that uh, contribution. Okay, until tomorrow, continue to be good. We'll pick up Layla tomorrow, as we say. I won't let her down. Uh, until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other.
do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. La ilaha illallah. <laughs> Layla.